Good morning. <laughs> How did you sleep last night? Yeah, it was a bit windy again, wasn't it? I had to batten down the hatches. But um, yeah, we're getting, we're getting used to a bit of wind, aren't we? <laughs> One end or the other, or outside. <laughs> So I'm Trish Duke and thank you for inviting me and I'm going to share with you today the secrets I have learnt from my elderly patients who have successfully lived at home in their own homes um, up until their 90s. So would you like to know their secrets? Yes? Now it's more in the mind than in the body, and you'll, you'll understand that one. And it'll help you or your elderly friends and relatives who might be in the room with you today um, to live an independent and fulfilling life for the rest of your days. So there's a little bit about my bio. I've been a physio for over 40 years. For the last, oh, tw maybe 20, I've been a mobile physio. So one or two of you might recognize uh, me from going around in a little blue car. I'm not quite retired yet from the physio. I've just stopped doing all my really long runs. You know, 10 hours in the sun is a bit much for me now. So um, I'm, not, I'm not going to ever retire properly. Um, I've been a local presenter for the Healthy Living Programme, you know, the local radio station, uh, best-selling books, Amazon, you know, and uni tutor and guest lecturer. I'm a woman. I can talk. <laughs> right. So this is the title of the talk, How to Stay Independent, Mobile, comfortable and enjoying life, not just surviving. You want to enjoy your life, don't you? And I've lost count how many times I've given this talk, usually to bigger audiences than normal for the organizations that I speak to, libraries, community centers, probus, etc. And this is a very big audience. Is this your normal size audience? Right, you're a very active lot, so you're going to love this, okay? And um, it seems to hit a bit of a chord for those of us who are already retired or thinking about it or coping with elderly relatives, either ones you lived with or parents. <laughs> um, I'd like to start with a few amusing questions to activate our feel-good hormones. Is that okay? You look like a fun crowd. So, have you ever bought anything online or over the internet? Who does that? Yeah. Yes, yes, I do. That's too easy, isn't it? Why do cats not like buying online? Because they like a catalogue. <laughs> <laughs> Why do the French eat snails? There's one for the back row there, right over there. Why do the French eat snails? I wonder, I don't fancy it, but anyway, they don't like fast food. <laughs> now, this is a really hard one here, the last one. There were 10 cats in a boat, one jumped out. How many were left? Who says nine? Any, any other answers? None. You heard this before? Okay. There, there were none left because they were copycats. <laughs> okay, right, so here we are. Now, have you heard the phrase, where the mind goes, the body follows? Have you ever heard that? Um, rally, any petrol heads in the audience today? Oh, right. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to talk about rally drivers. They, they tra in their training, they're taught to focus on where they want to go, not what they don't want to go to. They, they're taught not to avoid objects like trees, um, bales of hay, spectators, and they're focusing on the road where to go. And as we get more mature, we're often focusing on where we don't want to go. We don't want to go to a nursing home, we don't want to go to hospital, you know, we don't want to be lonely, we don't want to be this. And it's more avoiding, isn't it, very often in our mindset, rather than saying where we're going. Now, when you're children and you ask yourself, you would ask yourself, or people would ask you, what do you want to do? 
and it could be a possible career. In the old days, the boys wanted to be policemen and, 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 and firemen and things like that. Girls wanted to be secretaries, um, nurses, teachers, um, and now they've got a lot more choice. Um, but some of some of the some of the girls just wanted to get married and have children, and some of you may have you know been at, you know like like that, and that's that's good. It's very hard to marry the two these days, and they would talk about marriage and think about their white weddings and travel and all the things they wanted to do. But when you have children, you're asking yourself what you want to do. And that could have been have a full night's sleep. <laughs> Take I had twins at one point and an 18-month-old. So have a night's sleep was a luxury. So take a day off, rekindle the romance in your marriage, give the kids away sometimes, <laughs> um, wish the kids would grow up and leave home, and then you want to have grandchildren, which I understand is God's reward for not killing your own children. <laughs> And when the kids leave home, maybe you're wanting to start a career again. Enjoy a tidy house, take up golf or a hobby or do something out of the home. Travel, you've got a lot more time and opportunity to travel. Read a book without interruptions. All these things, you know, that you just didn't have time for and was annoying that you couldn't get to. But when we reach maturity, <laughs> whenever that is, I don't know, I'm not going to look. No one asks, what do you want to do? Do they? They're not thinking that you have got goals and dreams. Have we got goals and dreams? Yes, of course. But does the culture or maybe our younger relatives think that we can still have goals and dreams? Probably not. So in this culture, people assume that elderly parents um, are just surviving or trotting down the slope probably into the nursing home if things get too hard, and that's the inevitable. But I want to, rather than go down the slope, I want us to think about going up the slope. And the other thing about our, our adult children, I bet they thought um, that nobody's having sex when they're elderly. I mean, God forbid. I mean, what do we know about it? <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, and the, you know, they're saying at their age, it, um, it's not a nice thought for them. So, it's in this, it's, would you agree that it's assumed in the Western culture that seniors are making the best of it? They're enjoying pottering around and spending a lot of time at the doctors. <laughs> <laughs> Having tea parties, gently and quietly, as I talked about, sliding down into survival mode, expecting to be less mobile and need more help, often accepting that assisted living or a nursing home is just par for the course. Now, if you have a think deep down, or maybe we need to think deeper down here, is that subconsciously where we're trying to avoid and where we think that might happen to us? So see and speak what you want is very important. And if you go to any motivational speakers, psychologists, sports people, sports teams have psychologists, and they teach everybody to visualize making the play, getting the goal, you know, doing what they want, like the rally drivers, um, picture where they want to go. It's, the research has shown that's a vital strategy. And you may have been to talks or heard things about you need to have a board and write down what you want, like a new beer. BMW or a cruise ship and, and things like that. Um, that's all good, but it's very important that you think where you want to go, and it's a very powerful way of getting to where you want to go, of your choosing. Now, research, I'm very big on research, and on the internet now, we can get research from all over the world that's current uh, without going anywhere to get it. Um, research tells us that retirement isn't all it's cracked out to be, especially for women. Interesting. A lot of men are quite happy pottering around, doing a hobby, playing golf and, and doing things. But evidently, 80% of retired women who have worked out of the home um, aren't happy. They feel they've lost their purpose and their focus in life. 
So this may be your your children uh, if they're you know getting to that age where they're starting to retire, and it's portrayed on the media, you know. Um, retirement's going to be great. You know, you've got the boat, you've got the cruise ship, you can walk along the beach and, you know, and downsize your house and, and do all that. And then the other adverts are all about funeral funds, aren't they? <laughs> I find that a bit insulting, really. Um, but this is part of the culture that we need to change our mindset. So with seemingly endless time on their hands, women are more likely to spend their later years worrying about their health, feeling frustrated, and the need to watch every penny, because usually they're the ones that are going out shopping. They're also most likely to feel lonely because why a lot of women miss going to work, whether it's part-time, full-time or voluntary, is because they miss the camaraderie and the friendship. Uh, would you agree with that? Yes, you're nodding with that. And this is why a group like this and where you're living is so healthy because you've got friendship and camaraderie, but you've got your own space and privacy if you want to. While, while you're living in your own home. So one in three women over 65 live alone, and one in five men. So that's quite a big difference, isn't it? So the, um, you need to keep working full-time, part-time, or voluntary work, something that gives you a focus and a purpose, because that is an, it's better if it's related to your past career in some way, or, or your past strong points. Um, so that, that's what the research is saying. It's actually vital for your mental and physical health, it dramatically long term. So as I said, the men are much more happier pottering around and asking another cup of tea, love, you know, and all that. When's the next meal coming? But the women, you need to start thinking about doing something that you're going to, you know, um, enjoy. So that will use your unique talents and experience. Does that ring true for anybody? Yes. Okay. Now, I want you to change re one letter in retire. Which letter do you think I want to change? The F word. The F letter. Think refire instead of retiring. Retiring, we're thinking going backwards, downwards, lots of space in terms of time and things to do. Refire is, okay, I'm going to start with some new goals. I'm going to start with doing something um, that's going to give me purpose and a goal and life. And you get that buzz, you know, when you're doing something and you're part of something, don't you feel good? If you do voluntary work, you feel good because you've got a buzz, you're actually doing something. So you can still have dreams that are bigger than your memories, which is sometimes not hard if your memory is not too good. <laughs> and they also tell you that you must write your, might write your dreams down, write your goals down, not that you can't forget them. It's just forefront in your mind then. It's easier to keep them there. Okay. Who's this? Okay. Now, do you know what his story was? Yeah, at the age of 60 and on social security, so he didn't have a lot of travel money and money for hotels and things. Goodness knows where he stayed and if he thumbed a lift, but he went all around America trying to sell his recipe. And he, keep, he kept trying and kept trying. He could have just said, oh, well, I'll just... Stay on welfare, food stamps, as they call it in the States, I think, as well. And um, I'll just jog along and survive and go down there. But he was determined. Now, that wasn't based on his previous experience, other than in his own kitchen. He didn't have a restaurant before or anything. He was just determined he was going to do that. And was he successful? Yes. Yeah, he was. He was. He was, <laughs> he was successful. Um, another uh, person, one of my personal heroes... Uh, was a guy called Jim Lamers. He was a physio in Melbourne, and he designed cute little TENS machines. Anybody had a TENS machine? Yeah. Yes? That you, it's like a little battery, like I've got here, and pads, and you put it on, and it goes tick, tick, tick. It's like ants crawling up you, and it helps for chronic pain. So um, they had a lot of that. But the ones that we used, we gave out as a physio, were fairly, you know, 
health-like, and he made little cute red ones, and he designed those. So he was that was based on his past experience, wasn't it? And he started. He got his grandson to come in and do the websites and all the technical stuff and all that. Uh, he adapted his work to his age, and he was so he wasn't doing hands-on physio. He was using his wisdom and experience. Who's got lots of wisdom? You can all put your hands up. In fact, you can put two hands up. And who's got experience? Yes. Who's made lots of mistakes? Yay! <laughs> Absolutely. And that we can pass on to other people. So he came to the pain conference in... Uh, um, in Perth a few years ago and I wanted to meet the guy. I talked to him on the phone. It's always good meeting heroes in person, isn't it? So he arrived at the airport. One side of his face was the colour of your jumper. Black and, black and blue. Lovely on a jumper, not good on your face. <laughs> and he'd fallen in the shower. But there he was, taking his suitcases, his wife's suitcases. He'd come to the conference. It was doctors and anaesthetists, and he was fronting up with his own little booth, and that was it. Nothing was going to stop him. So I was even more of a hero. And um, so that, yeah, I'm good. Now, I'm going to show you the most expensive real estate. Are you ready for that? <laughs> oh, right. Yes. Can you see that? Now, underneath those tombstones, or scattered around the roses if they're ashes, are dreams and goals and books and inventions that people thought, one day, someday, I might, but who am I to do this? Um, I've missed the chance, it's too late, I'm too old. Don't understand the technology. You can come up with, you, you, know, you know, your own reasons. But it's all under there, and it's worth millions and billions of dollars underground all over the world and I, I'm here to tell you don't do that don't bury all that experience all that wisdom all that knowledge you have so much that you can pass on so the moon oh this is something I've got on my fridge shoot for the moon even if you miss you land amongst the stars you're still off the ground, and I've got that front on my fridge, because even if you only get halfway, you're still halfway, you've still started something, you've still done something, you may not have done as much as you planned, but if you shoot high, you will, you will actually achieve something. Personally, I'd rather try lots of things and fail at some, and just see them as a learning experience for the next try, rather than try nothing and succeed at everything. <laughs> How about you? Okay. So can you see we're talking about a mindset. Um, we talk about fighting old age. Why? why? Why should it be a fight? Why shouldn't it be a celebration? And why can't we just think about where we're going up rather than down, as we said there? So often, how often do we think about the positives of maturity? I don't like old age, <laughs> probably because I'm there, but um, you know, what are, what are the good things? We have more time, you know who your friends are, you can make new friends, you're wiser, uh, we're not bothered so much about what other people think, are we? Yes. So what other positives can you think of about being mature? You have more money, yes. Not everybody does, but um, yes, but what you have you can spend. Yes, you don't have to spend it on your children and, and, and uh, things like that. Yes, what are the, what are the positives? I'm living. Pardon? I'm living. You're living, that's a good positive. <laughs> that's a very, and I'm sure you can think of lots, of lots of ways you sell. So we need to think, rethink the term growing older as a positive for ourselves our friends and our relatives. Growing means new and improved. Now I heard a phrase recently at a conference and it says you're either green and growing or ripe and rotting. <laughs> My mind went to the smell. <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? 
So green and growing to, um, means that you're doing something, you're alive, you've got the sap moving in there and you know, you're growing up. I planted a passion fruit yesterday and I thought, well, I'm trailing it up there, I'm looking forward to getting it up there and to the fruit, it takes time, but it's green and growing. And um, so we go, through lots of we'll, we'll, we go through lots of ideas now to inspire you to live a good life fulfilling life right till your last day. So I want you to eradicate out of your mind old and useless. You know, think of things that you can do, how to make your dreams happen. It's not too late. When to ask for help. Get equipped when you need it. When you had a baby, you got a cot and a pram and, and all these things, you got equipped. As we're more mature, we need different equipment. Sometimes we have to go in the pram. <laughs> but you can still get self-propelled wheelchairs and, tell it, and, you know, where it goes where you want. And it's very important, as I said, the new research is we need to keep working where it's seen as work. Although it has to be fun, obviously. You're not going to go out and go cleaning and scrubbing floors and go, unless you like that. Anybody like cleaning? No. No. That's interesting. Not one hand. Any hands at the back? Didn't see that. There was a... Oh, yeah, one, one. Okay. Right. So that lady in red at the back, you want your house cleaned? <laughs> That's the lady to get in there and do that. Um, so when you, when you get more mature or your elderly relatives or people that you know, that you know they're struggling, the challenging tasks like cooking, shopping, gardening, dressing, sharing driving, all those things we can get help with. So don't struggle, think, oh, well, I used to be able to hold the cards, I used to be able to turn the taps, I used to be able to open the bottle tops and the jars. You know what's the hardest these days? You know when you get a bottle of water and the, and the top's so small? Do you find those difficult? Yeah, you can't get a grip on those, so um, that's annoying. Anyway, you can go to an occupational therapist or a physiotherapist, and they will t find you good equipment. Now, you may know about the Independent Living Centre. Have you heard of that? Have you had a talk from them? It's worth getting them, Eddie. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a free service. It's in Shenton Park, and it's run by OTs, occupational therapists and physios, and they have all the equipment you could ever want for living independently. That's why it's called the Independent Living Centre. And there's, you can ring them or go on the website, and they've got everything from bedding, computers, walking aids, kitchen aids, slopes, ramps, Oh, all sorts of things, and it's a free service. So you can make an appointment, go along and try them, and they book you in for an hour, and while you're there, you think, actually, I have a problem, you know, I've had a stroke, I have a problem buttering my bread, it sort of flies off, or I have to get my wife to do it, and I want to do it myself. And they have little gadgets that you think, well, I could have thought of that, but you didn't, did you? So <laughs> it's there, and they're cheap. And then they can tell you where you can buy them from. Rather than going to a shop where they sell the equipment, but um, they're as helpful as they can be, but they're not trained to know what you want, so you might not get exactly what you need. And it's a free service. So they have personal alarms and all that sort of things. And it gives your family good ideas of things that they can buy you for birthday and Christmas. Um, instead of, um, what you get soap, scented candles, bottles of whiskey, um, you might not mind those, flannel PJs, <laughs> all those things you can say, right, when you have Christmas I'd like a personal alarm or this or the rest of it. Now, who gets up to the toilet at night sometimes? Anybody? Okay. Yes? Okay. Do you turn the light on? No. Okay. Well, I'm going to put another. Right. I want you to really listen to this because this could save you a big trip to the hospital and, you know, that's not what you want to do. Those of you that have got reasonable balance, I want you to stand up and stand behind your chair. Stand behind your chair or somebody else's chair, get your balance. Whoops. Right, okay. Now I want you to 
Hold on with two hands and stand on one leg. Whichever one hasn't had the knee replacement. Okay, how are you going? Now take one hand off and then the other, if you can. If you can't, don't worry. Okay, that's just a bit of a test to see how your balance is. Now, put both feet down, put your hands on again, close your eyes, so the light's off, okay? Now do the same thing again, lift one leg up, lift one hand off, and then the other, and see if there's any difference. Yes, a big difference. Okay, take your seats again. Now, my, my patients tell me often, I've been in this house for 40 years, Trish. I know where the bathroom is, okay? I can get there with my eyes closed. Well, that's all good and true. But can you see how you use your eyesight for balance? So going to the bathroom at night without the light on, when you've got out of bed, you're a bit groggy and there's no light, you, your balance is not so good anyway in the middle of the night. And it's a time when a lot of people fall. And that's not a good time because you're on the floor for quite a while there. Um, so what you need to do is to get either lights that will, sensor lights that will come on, preferably on the floor so it's not going to blind you <laughs> as you get up, or you can get little night lights that just plug into the socket in the hallway. And if you're going out at night, take a torch to see where your feet are, so because that helps you with your balance, and, and hold on to somebody or help. So walking at night, again, is like standing with your eyes closed. And you're often talking to people or looking where you're going and not looking down. So are you convinced that you need to have a light on when you go to the bathroom at night? Yes, and you find your way. If you go down to your local hardware shop, of which we these days we just have one big one, don't we? <laughs> but they're fantastic. They have all these little lights for very little pennies, and it's going to save you a lot of, uh, um, a, you know, a lot of angst if if you fall. Men tend to bounce. It's not fair, they've got stronger bones, but women, we don't bounce so much, and um, so things can go snap. Right, support networks. Spread out your networks, um, or any care that you might need, as an ongoing thing, or just from time to time, if you're unwell or have an operation and you need to get you know, some help for a short time, spread it out between the professionals, the health professionals, physio, OTs, nurses or whatever, uh, friends who are able to help you. If you need your house cleaning, there's the lady on the back row. Um, family members, um, maybe church members, um, and the Shire can often give you help. So research out free or low-cost help for things that you need. I, I fell off at the pavement uh, or the sidewalk in um, LA a few years ago and I broke bones in both legs. That was interesting, especially with three Labradors. Somebody comes to the door, you're going to be allowed to get bowled over anyway. Um, so I spent a lot of time sitting in the wheelchair so I couldn't be bowled over. Um, it was just safer that way. But shopping was a problem. Because in Yanshep, they didn't have shopping deliveries. Now, it's so easy. So it's good to learn now how to do your shopping on the computer. Or you can get your daughter or your grandchildren to help you with that so that you've got your favourites in and they can do that. So your daughter in Sydney or Pakistan, <laughs> anywhere, can do your shopping for you. And anybody have their shopping brought to you? Livid, a lot of you do that. Do you find it good? Is it more expensive, do you think? So it's no more, it's just ten, $10 or so. Do you find that you spend more when you're going to the shop itself? No, I usually get my meals delivered and I just pick up my food and go to 
Okay, so you get your meals delivered. There's different ways of doing that, especially men on your own. Um, you know, you need to make sure that you eat properly. So they're very good. My, my, my experience of them is that they bring the, the packages in, they put them on the bench top for you, and with my oldies, I used to call them, I uh, don't anymore, um, my, my elderly darlings, um, they, 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 truck drivers used to actually put them in the freezer for them and in, and, and in the fridge, you know. Oh, really? Put the wine in the fridge too. Yes, you can order your wine online. Um, so, but the, the main key point I want you to take home is uh, on this aspect, is it's very tiring for one obliging family member. It's usually a daughter because women, you know, have that caring bit. But men, you know, that's just a general rule. Um, it's very tiring. They might say it's okay, it's fine, but it's quite exhausting doing that emotionally as well as physically. Um, so try and spread it out. And if the other siblings are going, oh, well, Sarah's doing it, she's not far away and it's easy for her, um, you need to put your foot down and start to, to get the others to help you. Okay. Now, it's, we don't want to always feel like we're getting help. We want a two-way thing, don't we? Um, so you can do a lot for the person who's helping you. Obviously, the health professionals get paid. But it's still nice to have a bit of a hug and a cup of tea on the way and, and um, something nice said to you so that you know your appreciators coming around, especially when it's this weather or really hot. Um, and um, so you can bake scones and do things or make make things or guys you can do you know help with handyman stuff because you've got the skills there's lots of things you can do that is a help but even a compliment and a thank you I appreciate that thank you for coming um, goes a long way so don't take your family for granted um, now volunteers who likes being a volunteer okay all right Okay. Why do you like being a volunteer? Tell me why you like being a volunteer. She said it makes her feel useful. Does it give you a bit of a buzz? Do you go home feeling good after you've done it? Exhausted, but good? Yes, exhausted's okay. You can, you can have a rest there. But a lot of us don't like getting voluntary work on us because it feels demeaning sometimes and our pride gets in the way and I should be able to do it myself. But if you do need help and it's a volunteer that comes, again, you need to appreciate them and thank them. But it's actually doing more for the volunteer than it is for you, in essence. So don't, don't be shy of getting that. Now, so, you have to strike a balance of living near your primary carers um, and, and, uh, you know, and um, don't let them have what I call carer fatigue. So that's an important. So strike a balance between independence and support. Be realistic but optimistic. Okay. I find that now when I go up a step ladder, I text my daughter and say, I'm going up a ladder or I'm going to cut the lawn with an electric lawnmower and because I live alone and if anything happened, I fell off the ladder or cut the cable or something, I could be there for a week. But I thought, mum's not answering her phone, which sometimes I don't. I don't always want to answer my phone, do you? Don't always want to be available. So, um, yeah, so I just do that as a, as a you know, as a little courtesy thing. Who's got a security pendant that they wear on their wrist or whatever? They are really good. They're now brought out ones with GPSs. So if you go for a walk or you go out somewhere, it can follow you and find out where you are and you can just press it and get help. And they're becoming more and more cost, cost, cost effective. But the usual ones that we used to give out only worked within the range of your home. So if you fell at the back of the garden, um, it still didn't work. Now, where do you, if you have a pendant one, where do you put it? You can put it in your drawers, <laughs> but not in the drawer. Now, if, you, if, if it's in the drawer in the bedroom and you fall in the kitchen and break your hip, how are you going to get there? You're not.
So it's one of the big battles I used to have. And this is where, you know, you can have the advantage, women, of you've got somewhere to tuck it. <laughs> Cleavage is a great place. Otherwise, they're swinging out and they annoy you. Yes, they're just... They get in your way. So put it in your cleavage. Guys, you can put it in your po pocket. You can get a wrist one. And they're getting smaller and smaller these days, and pink and blue and cute ones and all the rest of it. It's not only helping you to stay safe. It's helping your loved ones to feel that you're safe and they don't worry about you. So if you haven't got one and you are mature, think about it. If you're living with somebody, fair enough. But I've, I've got people that I've been looking after for a long time and um, one of them has less mental um, thinking abilities and the wife got stuck in the shower and he didn't know what to do. He, you know, he couldn't get in, he tried to help her and um, she didn't know where they, the pendant was, it wasn't on her and had he got it he may not have understood what to do. So, uh, you know, I said you've got to put that pendant round your neck and it's shower proof. So she said, yes, I understand that. And then where did she put it? In a handbag. <laughs> I said, Jean. She said, oh, okay, I don't like it. So then I taught her where to put it in there. And it's nice and warm and cosy and it doesn't bother you. Right. Um, let's have a look at this one, shopping. Okay. Fun, this is all research, fun and laughter improves your mental and physical health. Have we had a few laughs today? Yes, yes. you're going to feel better when you have a few laughs. Um, it's, it's really very important for your health, and any research would tell you. And ancient wisdom. In the book of Proverbs, in the Bible, it says, A merry heart does good like medicine. You know that verse? Yes, you know, that was ancient, ancient wisdom. And scientists say that the effect of one good laugh lasts up to 45 minutes in terms of the feel-good hormones. Smiling for 10 seconds can trick your body into feeling better. So even if you're not feeling happy, when you smile at somebody, it actually tricks your body. Now, this is all research. These people that have lots of degrees and have lots of paper, you know, bits of paper behind their names, um, that helps. Right, 100 laughs per day equal to 10 minutes aerobic exercise for your heart. How about that? Who'd like the aerobic exercise? Oh, well, that's good as well. Who'd like the 100 laughs? Yay! <laughs> it's good for your mental as well as your physical health. Hearty laughter raises the heart rate to 120 beats per minute, which is the same as during sex, without messing your hair up. <laughs> so, laughter is a great tension buster, physically and emotionally. Um, I remember going to a funeral and, oh, my... my, my Fa um, my mother's funeral and um, you know it's sad and of course it was a sad time and my uncle who was a Presbyterian minister at one stage and was very elderly he took the service and when it came to the time of pressing the button for the cask to go down he couldn't find the button so it, and he was ducking down everywhere and um, in the end, my sister and I got the giggles. I was going to wait five seconds and then go up and help him, and he found it, thank goodness. But um, it was a tension buster. <laughs> and it, was, it was a memorable one, and that was 20 years ago. Um, so laughter is a pain reliever. It increases healthy biological processes. It brings oxygen to your brain. Always handy place to have oxygen. And it makes you feel better with more energy. When you've had a good laugh, when you've done something that's made you feel happy, you go out feeling taller and happier rather than grumpy and... Um, I'm going to talk about grumpy things. Uh, so avoid or se severely minimise news and newspapers. It's a fear-mongering place. And do you feel good about life when you've watched the news? I mean, they might put a snippet on the end, which is good news. But it's, 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 um, it's an industry. Okay? So I would suggest that I, I, I don't watch it much at all. I think if the world falls down, somebody will tell me or I'll find out. You know? 
do we really need to know how many people have drowned or died or, you know, whatever? It's not helping us. We need to feast on funny movies, books, funny people, games, cards, CDs. Keep a library of funny things to do or to watch um, when you feel yourself slipping down on an emotional down day. We all have up and down days, don't we, physically and emotionally. And when the weather's, you know, wet for weeks and weeks on end, I was brought up in England, so we're talking months and months on end, and sometimes years and years on end. <laughs> it is very depressing, isn't it? But here, the sun's out today, the wind's gone, it was windy last night, and it makes you feel better. So when you're having a down day for whatever reason, don't go and put the news on, okay? Um, you know, and having a big cup of tea with a huge chocolate cake, that might help a little bit, but might not help your health. Think of something funny on lifting or go and see somebody who's fun. People have claimed healing of diseases and depression from laughter therapy. You may have heard of that, and that's good. Now, can you see that? It's a grumpy cat. It says, keep negative and grumpy people away and the cat says, what I really want is to direct you to the nearest door. <laughs> so, who knows grumpy people? Yeah. Are they sitting next to you? No. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure there are more people that can put your hand up. How do they make you feel? Yeah, you've got to hit them sometimes, don't you? Or slap them into shape. So negative grumpy friends and family, keep them at bay if you can. If you're living with them, then it's tricky. But shorten their visits or you have to put enough positive stuff in to counteract that. But people affect you, don't they? If they're happy and positive, they affect you. And if they're grumpy, they also affect you. So think about that. So there's little tricks if you see them in a shopping centre and they're heading towards you and you know they're going to ask you, do you want to have coffee or, you know, do you want to do something? So, like, oh, sorry, I have to go to the loo. Sorry, catch you later. Have a good day. You can disappear off. Bla elderly bladders are a great excuse for anything, aren't they? <laughs> and if they arrive at the front door... Or, uh, you know, you can say, oh, how lovely to see you. I'm just going for a nap. You don't tell a lie. You can always go for a nap. Um, I'm just going for a nap. I'm really, you know. Um, but do stay for a few minutes. And then if they don't get the hint after a few minutes, you can yawn, close your eyes, pretend to go to sleep or actually go to sleep. Um, but that's a way of shortening their visits. And people who are um, visited in hospitals often complain. Somebody comes and they sit and sit and sit. Have you had that? We've probably all done it ourselves. Because you think they're on their own, they're lonely, I'll keep them company. But in fact, they can't rest and recover so well. So sometimes when you're visiting people in hospital, stay for a short time, make them happy, tell them a few jokes, take them something fun to, you know, to watch or read or whatever, and then say, do you want to have a nap or do you want to stay a bit longer? And give, give them the choice. Um, so you can probably be, relate to that. Who likes singing? Yes. Who can sing? Yes. I just make a noise, so I'm okay in a big group. <laughs> but that actually has an effect on your emotional health, doesn't it? And um, so you can sing to the to you know the radio and um, or CDs. Andre Andre Rio, um, you all know who he is. Um, if even if you don't like him, uh, you can't watch a program or go to his concert um, and not come out happy, can you? Yeah. Anybody been to see him live? Yeah. Yeah. In Perth? Yes, I did that. I bought cheap tickets the last the night before and um, but very good and they were right up at the top and I went with a friend with wonky knees. So I Anyway, she got there. She just couldn't go to the loo halfway through. But <laughs> um, All right. It's wonderful to be silly at the right moment. So this is the lady on the swing and says, it says it's for, you know, there's often a sign, 16 and under, but sometimes the 10 year olds are heavier than us. Um, but I reckon she's recycled 12. <laughs> when was the last time you were on a swing? 
Yeah, a long time ago. They're actually kind of fun. They have bucket ones with a rope, you know, that, that, they're a bit tricky to get in these days. But it's just fun doing something silly. Um, Horace, here's some more ancient wisdom. Who's heard of Horry, a Roman poet? Yeah, we may have read him at school. I don't know. I don't remember. He said, mix a little foolishness with your serious plans. It's wonderful to be silly at the right moment. I can't imagine a Roman being silly, but I guess they must have done. But they drank enough wine, so I guess <laughs> that was possible. Right, worry. Do you know that the researchers said that 80% of what you worry about never happens? Worry is just thinking about what might happen in the future. But if you're focusing on where you want to go and you have a positive mindset, then the worry is going to be overridden. And um, it's a waste of energy. Would you agree? Yes. Worry is a waste of energy. Um, do you know it takes 25% tw um, more muscle power to frown, to frown than to laugh? Try frowning. <laughs> Laughter is, you know, but yeah. So it's, it's harder work doing that. Charles Dickens. Who's read Charles Dickens? He said, reflect on your blessings, of which every man has many, not on your misfortunes, of which all men have some. True? So there's all that ancient wisdom that says, focus on what's good. I have to get into bed at night, especially if it's a cold night and I've had a hot bath and electric blanket, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, thank you, God, for a lovely, warm, clean bed. How many people sleep on cardboard with leaky roofs? Um, they do, not in our country. Well, actually, we do. We have got homeless, we do. But we, we think of them tend to be in Africa and South America and places like that. But we have a lot that we take for granted, that having a gratitude attitude, as they say, does us good mentally. Now, I'm talking a lot about our mental things because if, if you think where you're going, as a man thinks, so is he. That's other ancient wisdom. Where did I get that out of? The Bible. <laughs> Shakespeare probably said it too. But um, it's all ancient wisdom and it's good stuff and it's still there. And if you go to motivational seminars where all the young ones go to and get all hyped up, they just tell them all this ancient wisdom. They just don't tell them where it comes from. Um, young and old sharing skills. Anybody got grandchildren? Yes. yes. Now, do they know something that you don't know? Do you know something that they don't know? A lot. So the young can learn from the older, and the older can learn from the young. So the granddad's teaching the grandson to drive. Hope he's taken his Valium before he got in the car. <laughs> and the granddaughter's teaching grandma how to work on the computer and do things. I got a young person to help me. I didn't even know how to turn it on a few years ago. And I had this little blue book with turn on, do this, do that. I uh, sometimes open that book just to have a laugh to see how far I've actually build websites now. Um, so, you know, that's taken a long time to learn how to do that. And I had, a, I had a neighbor who's now got a double degree in computer science and business, and he was just like 11. And I had a pile of $2 coins next to the computer. And every time he came over, I said, Cody, can you come over? Sometimes just to turn the jolly thing off, I couldn't do it. And I give him $2. And it was a good thing for him, and it was a good thing for me. So it's a sharing of skills. So, and then that helps you grow and do things you want to do. There's always somebody who's willing to help you. Um, use your skills for voluntary work. You can teach things. You can mentor. Uh, one of my patients, um, and some of you might be, is a mentor at the school. Now, he can hardly walk, he can hardly breathe, um, but he can get from the car into the school as an old soldier, and he's mentoring these young lads who often haven't got dads, and they've got no male model, and, you know, the culture these days with the children is um, they don't understand discipline or values, do they? So he's just getting alongside, helping them with the reading, teaching them, and he gets a lot out of that. So... Um, 
Mentoring is a really good way to share your wisdom on a, on a, a school's basis or if you've been in business, you can be helping other businesses, young businesses, to, 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 to learn things and for them to talk things over with you. Anybody know any single parents? Yes, lots of them around. And they really need the other half to have balanced parenting, really. They, they manage, they do a great job, but it's much better if they have a role model. So if single mums need a dad, now it can be a granddad, an uncle, or a neighbour, obviously who's safe, um, who can come in and just be the man and show the boys how to be men and the girls how to be princesses. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's a lot of princesses around. <laughs> Got two nieces that are princesses. Hmm. Anyway, um, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Short visits. Remember to pass on your wisdom, value system and memories to your own grandchildren as well as mentoring students. A lot of children and teenagers and people about to move home don't know how to turn the washing machine on or cook. I remember when I first moved out of home, I tried to make fish fingers. I couldn't throw the box away until I had it on the plate. Now, how many times do you have to read, grill three minutes on both sides? <laughs> so, um, all sorts of things there. So, you can teach them a lot there. Um, right, get out and about is another thing. People who are at home a lot, you have to make the effort to get out. Even if it's somebody driving you in a car going to watch the sunset and you go for... Uh, going on a train, it's free when you're mature, if you go out of peak hour, just getting on the train, going down to Mandura, coming back, or using your free pass to go to Kalgoorlie, just to go somewhere for a bit of a change. Medical research shows that if you take the ceiling off your head, there is less chance of you having mild to moderate depression. So in a cold climate like the UK, or in winters like ours, sometimes you don't get out so much, you don't sit out so much. And I arrived in the door with another lady and we were both running for the, for the rain. So you don't think, oh, I'll go for a walk in the rain. There are some people that go singing in the rain, <laughs> but they're paid to do that on a movie. Um, so do make the effort to get out, sit outside, go out, just to get out of the house. Um, find and treasure younger friends. Right, enjoy some young friends purposely. It could be grandchildren, it could be you going out to groups or somewhere, you know, you know what your opportunities are. And play with them, okay? It may be cars, it may be mahjong, um, you know, anything where you're doing something together and you're playing together. It could be your neighbour's children and you need the sunlight. Now, pets, are you allowed pets here? Yes, yes? how lovely. Um, women especially, and men, but more especially women, need uh, non-sexual touch, 14 touches a day is the research optimum, for their emotional health. It doesn't have to be a full-on hug, it can be just a touch, just, t just touch somebody next to you now, nicely, yeah, don't hit them, not too hard. <laughs> See the buzz, and it made you laugh, okay, it can be just touching an elbow, um, but it actually makes a lot of difference, and pets are good as well. I lost my two old Labradors in January, that was sad, I'll move on and I'll start crying, and I, I, I thought, oh, it's nice not having a clean house with no dog hairs and paw marks, but I've recently acquired a golden retriever, and within a few days it made a huge difference to me, because I had somebody to cuddle, and she's very cuddly, she's five years old, a good reason why she needed rehoused, so I'm back to the poor marks and the hair, but it makes a difference to me living on my own. So we, we do need, so when you meet somebody, um, especially if you're a British person, we, we weren't grown up with hugs so much. You may have, but my family and my culture, you know, wasn't like that. And um, then we moved to South Africa, uh, my husband and I, and everybody gave lots of hugs and it was like, ooh, that feels a bit weird. <laughs> and then I got used to it and I thought, I like this. Um, so just make a habit of that. And if it's not your way, just practice. Touch on the hand, t touching, you know, like, is it, is it hot? No, that actually felt quite nice. <laughs> so that's um, really important. So pets, um, touching, 
it's more than okay. These days, politically, people sometimes are worried about hugging and teachers, hug, you know, hugging kids and things like that. Um, but it's actually more than okay. We need to teach the younger ones that it's okay to touch and teach them how to do that appropriately. Um, it's vital for our emotional and physical health. Now, giving. The rich people in the world say they are at the happiest when they give rather than making money. And we've got a lot to give. Time, wisdom, listening ear, recipes, DIY jobs, touch, teaching youngsters how to cook, gardening tips, how to use a washing machine, iron clothes. Um, you could start a rent-a-grandparent service. You could make money out of that. Now, there's a little job for you. Um, now, exercising your brain, you've probably heard all this, haven't you? That if you exercise your brain, it's, it's very good for you, you know, it's warding off Alzheimer's dementia. If you don't exercise your arm, what's going to happen to your arm? It's going to get weak. If you don't exercise your brain, it's going to get weak. It's all just cells and nerves in there. So it could be crosswords, puzzles, games, learning something new on the internet, learning something new that you're having to think about, talking to people who are intellectual, um, talking to people who have different interests than you. And you might not be interested in what they're interested in, but asking questions and learning that mental interaction can be stimulating. Would you agree? Learning something new and challenging. Um, do you have a book club here? Do you read? Yes, book clubs are good because then you can talk about what you've, what you've read. I love reading. Whether the, one of my fears in life was I'd run out of books to read. But fortunately, people are still writing good books. <laughs> okay, I am going to sprint through these. You know about exercise? Yeah, I'm a physio. Who's exercising? Yes. Yeah. Who, walk, who walked over here? Lots of you. Okay. Two minutes. You can do two minutes here, two minutes there. It doesn't have to be a lot of exercise. Okay. Um, it can be um, with weights and these stretchy bands if you want to get specific muscles to, um, to get strong. Or you can just go for a walk, your dog or somebody else's dog, and walking. So we, we tend to think of exercise, I have to go to the gym. I don't like gyms, they have too many mirrors in there. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, yes, okay. So you can go to the gym, you can get a physio to come and get a program, but you've probably got the exercises on the wall, so somebody's worked it all out for you. But just going for a walk, or little foot bicycles, there's, you know, um, there's lots of different ways, and I'm sure you know all about that. Um, so, exercise. Let's see what's the next one. Okay. Let's bring the plane into land. Right, do you know, actually, one th another golden nugget. Do you know, does anybody feel that when they stand up, they've been lying down for a while or sitting, you, you get up and you feel a bit dizzy and you stand and you wait? Do you know anybody that does that? Probably, maybe you. What happens there is, you know, we've got wrinkles on the outside. Well, we've actually got wrinkles on the inside, too. <laughs> Thankfully, we can't see those. And that's when, when you swallow a tablet, sometimes they can get stuck in your throat. So you're going to need to take a big drink. Well, we have wrinkles in our, in our veins and arteries, in our legs. If it's extreme, it becomes varicose veins. And the valves that stop the blood going down, um, they can get a bit wrinkly, too. So when you stand up, a bit of blood goes into your feet because the veins are not holding it in your legs. And then you've got more blood in your feet and you've got less in your head, so you get a bit dizzy. So what you want to do before you get out of bed or off the chair when you've been resting and your heart rate's been going down is to pump your ankles up and down. Not swing your legs out, because that's like water in the bottom of a bucket. It's swinging the water into the bottom of the bucket. So if you're doing the knee bends, it's swinging the blood into your foot. Does that make sense? Okay. So all of you put your feet down and do the ankle pumps. Pardon? Uh, no. <laughs> Practice kicking the bucket? No, I don't want you to do that. No, okay. So pump, yeah. So your toes right down and then right up. So it's heels and toes. 
Now, put your hand down and feel your calf muscles and feel them working and stretching. Can you feel them? Now, if you go on a long haul flight, they tell you to do that anyway. Yes, when, when you fly, because that's to stop you, to keep the blood flowing so you don't get a deep venous thrombosis. But this is to get the blood up to your head. So before you get off the bed, off the chair, pump your feet up and down really hard a dozen times, and then stand up and walk away. If you stand up and stand still, where's the blood going to go? Back down to your feet again. That's right. And it's common how people fall. I've treated many people at home who've been to hospital, they had a fall, they've gone to hospital. What happened, they don't know. Somebody knocked on the door, they'd been dozing, they got up and shot off and dropped in, up at the doorway. Have you heard of people doing that? And they couldn't find out what was wrong with them. So after several days in hospital and acquiring a cold from the germs in there, they were sent back home again. And what's, what's happened with the physio? And I found that they said every time they got off the chair, they got a bit dizzy and they held on and then they went off. So that's it saved many falls doing that. Um, medications, always know what you're taking and why. Yes, doctor has gone out of fashion. Okay, there's Dr. No, <laughs> um, that's a movie, but always ask No what you're taking, especially when you come home from a hospital because you often come home with more medication, more painkillers, and you're already taking some. And yeah, um, drink lots of water, it keeps your blood thin. If you have a thick gravy, how do you make it thinner? Well, my mother made it thinner by putting red wine in it. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, tasted much better. So if you don't drink enough water because your personal plumbing's not working too well and you, you know, you're too scared to, have to drink too much, um, you're going to have high blood pressure. So that's it. Constipation, get rid of that. Otherwise, you're absorbing all the toxins. These are all things that my oldies, you know, um, would tell me. Uh, food, little meals often. And you know all about eating all the right stuff. Anybody been on a cruise? I go on a seafood diet there, see the food and eat it. <laughs> um, and if you can cut out sugar of any shape and form, you know, in sauces, in anything, uh, it's the sugar that makes you fat, not the fat. And you, you've seen lots of that on TV, haven't you? You know, that's the fat. Now, the key thing is write your goals down. Think about, when you go home, think about what you want to change now. Think about what you want to do, where you want to go, and write it down. Put it on the fridge, put it somewhere, you know, the back of the toilet door, somewhere where you can remind yourself of where you want to go. Focus on where you want to go, not where you don't want to go. And if I've been preaching to the converted, and you're already in that mindset, well, congratulate yourself you realize you've actually, you've gone against what is, is the normal tide. But if you find that there's areas that you need to think about and adjust, that's okay. It's not too late. So focus on where you want to be, record those goals, look and speak them daily, okay? Look at them daily and enjoy the rest of your life thinking of where you're going up in life, not where you're going down. Any questions? No. Okay. Well, thank you very much for listening, and it's lovely to have such a big crowd. Thank you.